Good evening, my name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. This is my second piece on restoring our republic by examining Jeffersonian democracy. In Jeffersonian Democracy 1, we discovered that the Declaration of Independence was largely attributable to the ideas of the British philosopher John Locke. And here he is. <clears throat> who stated that government existed only by consent of the people, and that Jeffersonian democracy could be traced even back to Aristotle, who thought only a society with a broad middle class that was largely unbeholden to any master could survive as a republic. We seek to restore a republic that finally collapsed with the Patriot Act that violated everything this country was founded on so severely that we can no longer truly regard this as the United States Republic, but as an autocracy and a dictatorship. From the libertarian right, these views are articulated by Ron Paul and Gary Johnson. From the left, people like Gore Vidal and Dennis Kucinich. But rather than resorting to inventing an entirely new system, and perhaps engaging in actual armed resistance to this new tyranny, masquerading under its consumerist happy face, we must first review how the Republic was conceived and formed, attempt to redress and remedy the flaw in the system through probably a constitutional convention, the flaw in the system that led to a two-party system where no minority voice could be heard, a conception feared from the beginning but not seen to be sewn into the fabric of the Constitution. The research thus far simply shows that democracy was feared, just as we might fear vagabonds breaking into our houses. Not necessarily, but with shades of the assumption, was as George Will distastefully pronounced, which I shall now present to you, what George Will distastefully pronounced. Let's see if I can get it. On Tuesday, American voters are going to choose which section of the American elite they want to govern them. Who says that's the choice? Conservative pundit George Will did. That was in the fall of 2008 during the presidential elections. Here's what he had to say. Surely in a democracy, it's time for us to quit being sentimental and say the question we settle in an election is not whether elite shall rule, but which of no, the he shall rule. George Will did something that no one's supposed to do on American television. Acknowledge that we live in a class society. Of course, in elections, we hear all about the middle class. You can hear the great Paul J. later. <clears throat> but the, there was shades of this assumption in the founding, and Gore Vidal can instruct you more uh, about this matter. In ABC News uh, 2008, that was the reference. I must walk from the days of the original arguments to ratify the Constitution forward into the times that caused Jefferson to pronounce his election in 1800, a second American Revolution. I wonder as we walk through time, how many American revolutions there have been, to discover when and if these fatal flaws were detected, and whether the second American revolution was thought to permanently provide a remedy to them. A small elite of powerful men controlling the destiny of the American public, who, once we reach the limits of our conquest, that is, after World War II, the United States expanded to a certain point, and then occurred the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, sometime between those two events, uh, our standard of living began to fall for our middle class and our uh, lower class. <clears throat> we began to fall in standards of living, education, and finally, freedom. There were about 80 Federalist papers published by Madison, John Jay, and, ha and Alexander Hamilton under the pen name Publius. The first that is considered significant is Federalist 10, and there we will start. Federalist 10 deals with how to prevent any faction or group or interest from dominating the political life of the country, sufficiently to structurally damage the rights of the people and the security of the country. The security meaning the people's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the preservation of a union of free people generally. Now, some people would say that at the time of the revolution and beyond, uh, and the ratification of the Constitution. It was only for white property males, but that's not really true. In certain states, women were allowed to vote. In certain states, such as Massachusetts, blacks were allowed to vote. 
So I would like to just show you an interesting uh, piece of information here, if I can find it quickly. The history of black, black voting in the 1700s. It's Delaware, Maryland, New Hampshire, New York. A citizen of color was entitled to all the privileges of a citizen. So you see it was a mixed bag. However, by 1820, all of this was rolled back. So it seems to me that the golden age of American Republic was up until about the end of James Madison's presidency. Uh, now, many people consider Andrew Jackson a populist. Who came after James Madison. But Andrew Jackson was so violent towards the Native Americans that for me, uh, I will go carefully through Andrew Jackson as well, but it's hard for me to consider that the golden age of the Republic. And Andrew Jackson had a huge controversy with our first great Chief Justice. <clears throat> So Federalist 10 deals with this issue, uh, and uh, the issue is how to prevent a minority or a faction from dominating and damaging the Republic. And as the founders died off, these rights of women and blacks in some areas to vote landless men were gradually eroded. <clears throat> So I'm going to briefly go through about 26 points that Federalist 10 argues. One, a well-constructed union's primary advantage is preventing one faction or power structure from dominating. Two, a plan which can protect against this is critical. Three, the American Constitution, which was thought perhaps the best work on popular government at the time by many, is understood not to be foolproof. Four, can government be designed to protect the public good in the conflicts between rival parties? Five, measures are too often decided not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minor party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. Six, these must be chiefly, if not wholly, effects of the unsteadiness and injustice with which a factious spirit has tainted our public administrations. And I ask, add as an aside, this also begs the question of whether mankind can be trusted without ever sacrificing the short term for the long term. Seven, a faction is any group which unites under some impulse, interest, or passion adverse to the rights of other citizens or the permanent and aggregate interest of the community as a whole. Eight, there are two methods of curing the mischief of faction, the one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. Nine. There are again two methods of removing the causes of faction, the one by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence, the other by giving to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Interestingly, we can say that this is what our mass media intends to do, uh, or so it seems at times. Eliminating liberty to cure faction is to destroy political life itself. The cure is worse than the disease. 11. Eliminating faction through eliminating differences of opinion is equally impractical. A government based on equality of opportunity but not equality of condition will inevitably lead to different interests and opinion. Each person has different interests and capabilities which will result in different levels of resources and wealth, which will intensify over time. By protecting the rights of people to obtain property through their efforts, inequality will occur, which will result in different interest groups based on, in particular, the possession of in different degrees and kinds of property. And here I'll quote him directly. I've modernized the language. I tried reading it in the original archaic uh, 18th century English. I was horrified to discover that most people cannot understand it. It's really not that difficult if we had a proper educational system. <clears throat> as long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other, and the former will be objects to which the latter will attach themselves. The diversity in the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate is not less an insuperable obstacle to uniformity of interests. The protection of these faculties is the first object of government, and the protection of different unequal faculties of acquiring 
property. The possession of different degrees and kinds of property immediately results from the influence of these on the sentiments and views of the respective proprietors ensues a division of the society into different interests and parties. 12. Opinions and interests differ in matters of religion, government, and many other matters, in theory as well as in practice. Attachment to different leaders and personalities have divided mankind into parties and inflamed animosity and conflict has more often been the case than cooperation for the common good. So strong are these divisive tendencies that even the most minor frivolous issue can cause great conflicts and controversies to break out. 13. Wealth and equality is the most common source of division. Additionally, the different industries have different interests. The regulation of these competing and interfering interests is the principal task of legislation. The most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with many lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations. and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction and the necessary and ordinary operations of the government. 14. No person is allowed to be the judge in their own case, so they wouldn't, as they would deliver both a biased judgment and have their integrity corrupted. And what is legislation except effectively a succession of judicial verdicts, not on individual cases, but on the rights of whole sections of society? And what are the legislators but advocates and parties to the causes they determine? Here I quote directly. Is a law proposed concerning private debts? It is a question to which the creditors are parties on one side and the debtors on the other, when we think of the Wall Street bailout. Justice ought to hold the balance between them, yet the parties are and must be themselves the judges, and the most numerous party, or in other words, the most powerful faction, must be expected to prevail. Here I quote again, Shall domestic manufacturers be encouraged, and in what degree, by restrictions on foreign manufacturers? Are questions which would be differently decided by the landed and the manufacturing classes, and probably be by neither with a sole regard to justice and the public good? The apportionment of taxes on the various description of properties is an act which seems to require the most exact impartiality, yet there is perhaps no legislative act which greater opportunity and temptation are given to a predominant party to trample on the rules of justice. Every shilling, that is, every dollar, with which they overburden the inferior number is a shilling saved to their own pockets. We 15. We cannot rely on enlightened statesmen, because those in office may not always be wise, and even if they are, they may not be able to see long-term and all the implications of their policies in the heat of the moment. My own aside. In fact, the theme of much of this is that by having a larger pool of people to select representatives from, better quality will occur. However, the, that, quote, right size, neither so large as to render the average voter powerless, as could be argued as the case today, nor so small as to not provide a diverse enough talent pool is one question. I would think no, and here is the real problem. The virtual monopoly incumbents appear to possess, while simultaneously incredibly low opinion of Congress, perhaps only other Congress, other people's congresspersons, not one's own. So in the United States, you will see <coughs> This is our re-election rate in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Yet, if you look here, you will see that we are at an all-time low. But it seems that people have a good estimation of their own, um, their own legislators' uh, 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 rating. So I think I can find that for you. If we just go down to the footnotes here, so this shows you the rate approvals of the various senators. So as you can see, <clears throat> people seem to approve their own senator, but nobody else's, or the result of the whole group. So 
16. Therefore, we cannot safeguard against factions stripping the rights and liberty of other groups or the people as a whole to either ensuring a uniformity of opinion nor of banning certain points of view outright, attacking, in other words, attacking these factions' rights. Therefore, we must control and mitigate the effects of faction, factions coming to power. To directly quote, the causes of factions cannot be removed. Relief can only be found in controlling their effects. If the faction 17, if the faction is not a majority politically, then the majority can prevent politically harmful legislation through a simple majority vote. It may clog the administration, it may convulse the society, but will be unable to mask the effects of its violence under the forms of the Constitution. Unfortunately, we find that many things mask their violence under the forms of the Constitution today. When the majority itself is a faction, this is 18, democracy would permit it to harm both the public good and the rights of other citizens, minorities, which is not to be construed as racial in this talk. But anyone not supporting the majority faction which seeks to impose its will in a harmful way. 19. To secure the public good and private rights against the danger of a majority faction and at the same time to preserve democratic government is then the objective. 20. The only two ways to prevent oppression by a majority temporarily in power would be to either convince them their actions are harmful, that is to dissuade them, or to construct the republic in such a way as to limit their ability to harm their public welfare and rights of minorities, quote, render them unable to conduct their schemes of oppression, unquote. 21. It is therefore must be admitted that a pure democracy is powerless against a majority who seek to oppress others. Quote, to sacrifice a weaker party or an obnoxious individual, unquote. This is why such democracies have historically been volatile and unstable. They have been short-lived and have often ended violently. This makes me think of Chile under the socialist Allende when they talk about being short-lived and ending violently. That is, when the people's impulses to redistribute uh, run very high tempers, then the old money classes bring the military in to suppress them in that particular case. They have been short-lived and have often ended violently. Theoreticians have mistakenly thought that by providing perfect equality in political rights, people would at the same time develop equality in their possessions, opinions, and passions. A republic, meaning a system of representative government, can solve this problem. A system of representative government can prevent the tyranny of a majority. Ideally, a system of representatives will select the best people in the country. However, it can have the opposite effect. A small number of people may form a cabal or a conspiracy and betray the interests of the people. This brings the question of scale. Would the betrayal of the public trust be more likely in a small or a large republic? At the time of this writing, about three million people lived in America. So in terms of scaling our government and arguments of scale, this is an important issue. Let's see if I can bring it to you quickly. So here are the colonies and thousands of people in 1780. 49,000 in Maine, which is part of Massachusetts. 206,000 in Connecticut. 210,000 in New York. 327,000 in Pennsylvania. 538,000 in Virginia. 10,000 in Tennessee. 10 Tennessee was not actually part of the Union. Only the ones that showed two uh, were actually uh, the original 13 uh, states of the Confederation. So at the time of this writing, about 3 million people lived in America. States and populations are from about 50,000 to 500,000 people. The scale they were dealing with was totally unlike what we are dealing with now. One could infer from these numbers that a representative having 250,000 people in his district would have been the maximum conceivable. That is a senator from the state of Virginia. Two senators, 500,000 people. Today, a senator from California, such as Dianne Feinstein or Barbara Boxer, would have nearly 100 times that population conceived of by the framers in their time, and this is important. 23. 
There is a golden mean to be found. If too great a population be assigned a representative, that person will be out of touch with their constituents' local interests, and if too small, they're not capable of comprehending issues on the national and international scales. The federal constitution addresses this. This is what Madison argues. The great issues go to the national and the local to the state legislators. So this brings me to footnote number two. See if I can find this for you. There's an interesting article here. Let's see if I can get it. Okay, so number two is not in here. Number two is an article that I found which is quite interesting. Building a bigger house. So this gentleman argues that at the time that they had specified there would not be more representatives than one for every 30,000. So more than, th that means that no less than 30,000 people could be represented by any given uh, representative. When they actually uh, came together in 1789, each representative represented 60,000 inhabitants. But after the 1910 census, when the House grew from 391 to 433 members, the growth stopped. By the time the next decade rolled around, members felt themselves reluctant to dilute their votes, and the issue was never seriously considered again. So based on these numbers, 5,000 would be a potential number. So getting back to the point, I am of the opinion, I am of the opinion, that rather than simply increase the House to 2,500 to 5,000 members, we should indeed set a maximum limit per representative of 100,000 people. So this Mr. Conley is arguing, he is arguing that by having such massive numbers of people per representative, it's very hard to get minority opinions represented. The, the scale has grown too large. So the problem of provincialism and of unmeritorious person getting into office because the candidate pool is too small is reversed. So what I recommend is that we set a maximum limit uh, of 100,000 people per representative, which would be 3,000 people in the House. And it should no longer be assumed that they would all sit in a room together, but they could work as the rest of us by online methods but that we should add a third chamber that is not bound by state, that permits voting nationally, and that each representative in the parliament or national assembly, that third chamber, represent exactly as many votes as he obtains, with a minimum number of votes being set at 60,000, the original number. People voting for people to not get elected would be allowed a second round, or perhaps simply be fractional representatives, in which case no person would ever lose. So the internet, Potentially, you could vote for yourself, and you could be in the House, and you would have one vote. There might be as many as 120 million votes on any given issue. And if you delegated your vote to somebody else, and that person accumulated 30 million votes, that would be okay, too. So we could actually imagine a voting system where no one ever lost, not in the election of the representatives. Of course, people would lose when voting on issues in the parliament or the National Assembly or the third chamber, because what I'm talking about is a second constitutional convention, and what sort of ideas are we going to put forward to prevent the loss of political power by the individual? <clears throat> people voting for people do not get elected. Your vote would always delegate your political power successfully. The Internet Congress could include voting for yourself. Rules could be set in place at some level minimum level of participation occur, just as in a voluntary uh, group. If you don't show up a certain amount of times, you would be cast out. And the office would not necessarily require any budget or salary. <clears throat> so let's see here.
Therefore, we cannot uh, 16. Therefore, we cannot safeguard against the cause of action. Relief can only be found in the control of the effects. Because therefore, it must be powerless. Okay. There's a golden mean to be found capable of addressing these issues. The federal constitution addresses this. Okay. 24. The proposed constitution also provides a strong framework for adding new territories to the Union. And as these territories are added, the prospect of a single faction dominating are lessened. To which I comment, with the advent of enormous groups and corporations, this strikes one as somewhat more hollow today. That is, that as uh, the size of our republic expands, the ability of powerful groups to dominate is now increasing. 25. The smaller the society, the fewer number of factions and people. Now here I make an aside. Here it is made clear that the two-party trap we laid for ourselves was not seen in Federalist 10. Extend the spheres and more parties and interests must be incorporated, as we know. If we added another state, that would not get all uh, indicate that we would get another political party that was capable of winning an election at the national level. Yet today we seem to have a paralyzed system, my own words, and the larger it gets, the harder it is for the middle and lower classes to influence the whole. If such a common motive existed to oppress others under a single faction, it will be more difficult for the oppressing faction to act in unison. Here my aside. Consider how the Republican Party rewrote its rules to function entirely as a centralized command after the Ron Paul movement in effect rebelled from the centralized leadership. In fact, with modern technology, the larger the scale, the easier to dominate, in some cases at least. 26. Additionally, where there is a conscious awareness of dishonorable purpose, communication is checked by distrust in proportion to the number whose concurrence is necessary. And here, my aside, this is the main argument against conspiracies. In fact, what we hear is that in cases of government criminal misconduct, such as seems to have occurred in the Kennedy assassination, the rank and file are simply told to keep their mouths shut about some piece of the puzzle they are involved with, without telling the policeman or agent the entire dimensions of the conspiracy. So basically, the larger the web, the more likely somebody is to leak the conspiracy. But of course, now we have severe, severe punishments for people who leak conspiracies. When we look at Obama has the worst record of any precedent on, on prosecuting whistleblowers. <clears throat> and look at the case of Bradley Manning, who is stripped naked, uh, thrown to the dogs for trying to bring to the American public the truth. And American military members who have expressed sympathy or support with WikiLeaks have been found technically, legally, to be in the same position as having joined Al-Qaeda, that is, to give support to an enemy of the state. 26. Okay, 27. A large republic's advantage over a small one. My critique is this section is not necessarily of Madison directly here. As he conceived of Congress, who are civil represent, would represent between 10 and 100,000 people, rather than now as many as 19 million, in the case of Feinstein, an average of 750,000. A single faction is less likely to dominate. This is supposedly, a, these are, there are three advantages of a large republic over a small one. But when we think of Hitler, or Stalin, or corporatism, tyranny is, is in fact no less likely to occur on vast scales, and in fact is more likely. B. The representatives are more likely to carry enlightened views and virtuous sentiments superior to local prejudices. But I say to that, if absolute power corrupts absolutely, does not great power also corrupt greatly? He goes on to say, it is likely that the national representatives will have these qualities. And I suppose it's true that you need a certain size of pool to get good candidates. But again, the scales he was envisioning would have been the scales of a small town representing the, a representative in the House in terms of population changes since the Revolution and the ratification of the Constitution and the first sitting of our Congress. C. Does it consist in greater obstacles opposing the accomplishment of secret wishes of an unjust and interested majority? And here I say, worse than that, money and power hoodwink the majority into clamoring for their own oppression by a plutocratic minority. The question is, how does scale prevent a faction from doing violence to the public good and the people's freedom? What is the correct scale? 
I believe one attractive approach is a strong local voluntary solutions with a lightweight libertarian superstructure. Things like worker-owned uh, schools and worker-owned hospital clinics and cooperatives and credit unions as opposed to opt-in structures that can be punished by people not choosing to join them rather than mandatory educational system that is failing us so badly and it's one of the most expensive in the world. In this time of alienation, that is where people feel powerless about whether they'll be able to keep their job, their house, their education, their medical care. That's what alienation is. And centralization, the impulse is to the opposite end of the spectrum. It is said central government, whatever scale it is envisioned, must keep in check any one group from dominating the others. However, it is possible that if we can restore freedom and liberty, we can do it by reclaiming the resources, land, and property stolen from us through corruption and fraud. We could certainly reclaim trillions of dollars in fraud and corruption uh, that was siphoned off by us with the collusion of government and industry. Halliburton would certainly simply be c turned into cashier's checks and sent out to the citizens if it was my uh, decision, as well as Kellogg, Brown and Root, and many, many others, Raytheon and General Dynamics. But I do believe the employees of these companies have a place at the table. I don't have to bear any ill will to them, not even down to their CEO, perhaps, because of the structure. Although, in the case of Halliburton, I wouldn't go that far. And, be, I, and I also recommend that we be careful not to buy, to buy and trade with local businesses to do so, and institutions that treat their employees well, or are owner-operated or worker-owned. Then from there, carefully buy from companies and institutions that have the same values, that are larger, and simply cease feeding the large corporations that use our profits to then go out and buy our representatives. 28. Factious leaders may kindle a flame in a region, but will be unable to spread to all regions. Religious sects may degenerate into a political faction in a region, but on sufficient scale, the number of faiths and sects will prevent any one sect from dominating. We think of the rise of the evangelical right. A rage for papal money, or the equal distribution of property, or the abolition of debts, or any other violation of the rights to property of the citizenry, will be less likely to come to pass in a larger union. Here he is right. A revolution of the poor is harder to accomplish with a more powerful state. A federal republic will best address these issues. This is where he ends. This final note ends powerfully enough, but it is a matter of how this federal republic is organized. We currently are strangled and immobilized by vast power structures, factions who prevent anyone from entering office not in either of the two parties, meaning anyone not choosing these pseudo choices has his political voice strangled. This was not intended. That the same interests fund both of these two parties to ensure that they cannot lose regardless of the appearance of a transfer of power. A federal republic in and of itself is workable, but not one where the minority always loses elections to two parties owned by moneyed interest that control the presses and the minds of the citizens by spending whatever amount of money is necessary to prevent their own loss of ever greater accumulation of wealth at the expense of the poor and the middle class through non-productive activities, such as stimulating the appetite for products. Consumption is not production. This is a fallacy. Less consumption is greater wealth in many cases, not less wealth. Corrections, military spending, disaster capitalism all show that what we call the economy is something that only exists because we are not self-sufficient. If we were self-sufficient, we would not need jobs. That is an allocation of a small crumb of massive corporations' production. I must end on that. this note. 75% of our economy does not produce real, real wealth, and non-productive activities actually destroy wealth. Many occupations at the right scale are necessary, but as each seeks to expand their empire, they spread like cancer, the military, spying, bureaucracy, disaster, medical capitalism, such as uh, the poor having diabetes and making $175 billion a year uh, total uh, cost, 10% of our entire medical system. Finance run amok. 
what percentage of our population do we really need to determine whether our business plans are good enough that they should be uh, manifested. And isn't it an irony you meet people that want to invest in the right things, um, like professors groups, but they don't have any options other than to invest with companies like Fidelity. They don't, there are no structures for them to invest in local small business, not easily accessible. And my friends who are uh, investment advisors don't want to get involved because it's too complex. So the very the, the money f gets f siphoned off to the wealthy, even in the case of people who want to do the right thing. Insurance, being more than 1 or 2% at max of our economy, is out of control. Food becoming fake, real food becoming prohibitively costly, real estate uh, in the function of speculation shouldn't be more than 1 or 2% of our economy. The loss of our manufacturing and our industry, inflation of 8% in education and medicine, while savings pay an interest of 1 or 2%. All these are examples of a fluff, busy work economy, rather than the peace and quiet of a self-sufficient free citizenry that sells their services rather than their time. In other words, that each of us should be like a small business person and have control of the terms of our activities. The yeoman freeholders of old had a family business for buying luxuries and manufacturers and a wholly owned farm and homestead for their basic needs. We can achieve this in modern times with technology. We could live extremely well, all of us, if we were willing to spend 10 or 20 years rebuilding and restructuring our republic and our economy. <clears throat> so the conclusion. Madison and Jefferson were thought to carry similar anti-federalist views. And in fact, the arguments exposed by Madison and Federalist 10, and in fact, the arguments espoused by Madison and Federalist 10 that are most troubling are in fact Federalist views. If my understanding that Federalism understood that elites would govern, and anti-Federalists persisted in attempting to protect the freeholders, the bulwark of democracy as well as the republic, Hamilton and Jefferson had more in common than in disagreement. They both sought to create a successful, vibrant country with different emphases on where power lay and was distributed. Here we see elitist assumptions hidden under fine rhetoric that would lay a seed in the Union that has borne bitter fruit. In fruit of a people first dispossessed of the Republic and second the Republic overthrown. With a mere shell, as my father said long ago, a corporate dictatorship with a veneer of democracy, and with 9-11 and the Patriot Act, the end of the Republic, the death of the Republic, an autocracy and dictatorship that has driven our legal rights back to before 1215 AD, we've eliminated due process of law through the Patriot Act, which is elimination of Magna Carta. We've eliminated habeas corpus. You no longer have the right to confront your accusers, which was passed in 1679. So we've driven our law back to before 1679 in that case. And Posse Comitatus of 1878 was overthrown at Waco, where the army uh, killed uh, the innocents. And in fact, in the new National Defense Authorization Act, So that's my analysis of Federalist 10. Thank you, and good night, and good luck.